May the peace of Christ be with you. Today we're discussing book two of Cicero's Deo Ficis, or On Obligations. And in book two, Cicero turns to the topic of the useful, or the advantageous. Primarily, he considers what virtues are useful for statecraft, for governing a, um, well, ideally for governing a, governing a republic. Uh, of course, he begins then with some uh, personal reflection on the decline and essential fall of the Roman Republic. He writes on page 55 of your uh, translation uh, for Oxford's World's Classics, he writes, I only wish that the state had retained the form which it had of old. It's talking about the Republican tradition in Rome. And that it had not fallen into the hands of men who were eager not so much to reform its politics as to subvert them. In the first place, I should now be devoting more effort to public activity than to writing, as was my routine when the Republic still stood. And secondly, I should be committing to writing not my present works, but my speeches, as I often did. But once the Republic, in which all my attention, thought, and effort were centered, ceased wholly to exist, inevitably those speeches delivered in court and in Senate fell silent. There was none to be written down. There were none to be written down. So uh, I think it adds poignancy to the discussion of the virtues useful for statecraft in Book Two of Deo Ficis, when we think about um, the collapse of the Republic, Cicero's beloved Roman Republic, uh, which is the context for uh, the writing. Uh, and like many uh, great statesmen thinkers uh, throughout time, Cicero turns to philosophy in part for consolation in the face of great loss, um, which leads him on page 56 to declare a love for wisdom, which is after all the meaning of philosophia, the love of wisdom. He writes, So though beset by the greatest misfortunes, I have, it seems, gained this blessing of writing on topics which my fellow citizens were insufficiently acquainted and which were supremely worth knowing. For in heaven's name, what is more desirable, more preeminent, better and worthier of a human being than wisdom? Philosophers is the name given to those who seek it. And philosophia, should you wish to translate it, is nothing else but zeal for wisdom. As philosophers of old defined it, um, wisdom is the knowledge of things divine and human and of the causes that hold them together. Should anyone pour scorn on such study, I cannot possibly imagine what such a person thinks worth praising. If, on the one hand, you seek intellectual pleasure and respite from your troubles. Can there be any to compare with the pursuits of those who forever investigating all that looks to and promotes the good and happy life? If on the other hand, what you have in mind is the means to steadfastness and virtue, this is the discipline by which to attain them, or uh, no such possibility exists. To claim that there is no branch of study which broaches the great questions when no subject, however trivial, is without one, is the mark of men who speak with insufficient reflection and who go astray in matters of the greatest importance. But if some means of studying virtue does exist, where will you look for it if once you abandon this branch of learning? So he's saying to his son, seek wisdom. Right? And he's saying, seek wisdom for the good, for the, the common good, and for the pursuit of the good life, and also as a means of consolation 
when fortune um, turns against you and against what you hold dear. And so, of course, after so ardently and, and movingly professing the love of wisdom, uh, he has to uh, some degree defend uh, his position as, as a skeptic, um, as a, a doubter. And he does this on the top of page 57. He says, I only wish that these critics were sufficiently aware of our, that is the skeptic's, position. We are not the sort of people whose minds are adrift in error and who never have a guiding star to follow. So he's saying skepticism does not imply um, the abandonment of wisdom. What sort of mentality, or rather what sort of life, would it be if a rational basis, not merely of argument but also of living, were taken away? So he's saying his skepticism is not a total skepticism. It's not an abandonment of the idea of truth. We saw how much truth means to Cicero in Book One from Deo Fickies. He says the other schools say that some things are certain and others uncertain. We disagree with them and say that some things are probable and others improbable. So there, there. So what is there to prevent me from following what seems to be the probabilities and from repudiating improbabilities? And by avoiding the conceit of making dogmatic claims from giving a wide berth to the rash judgment, which is so greatly alien to true wisdom. And so, in fact, Cicero's skepticism is part of what we today might call his conservatism in regards to the Roman Republic and Roman culture. He says, you go for what's probable, which often involves sort of trusting uh, the established way, what the Romans would call the mos maiorum, the ways of the fathers. Um, but you bring moderation to yourself. You avoid rashness um, by never sort of charging ahead with too much certainty. Um, and so uh, Cicero defends skepticism as a uh, philosoph philosophical school that is good uh, for the pursuit of the honorable and the virtuous life, as he laid it out in Book One. Um, and so from there, he then moves on to exploring the common good, um, returning to that key theme uh, that we saw established in Book One of Deo Fickies, that human beings are created for or intended for or find our telos, our purpose in common life, uh, life together. Um, he makes an essential point for understanding book two that, that what we call civilization is the cooperation of human beings. He says this on page 59. He says, why should I catalog the numerous skills without which human life could not even have existed? Right? There are too many to name. He says, how could, how could the sick be tended? What pleasure could the, those in rude health enjoy? What means of sustenance or cultivated life would we have if those numerous skills did not confer on us those things by which our refined human existence contrast so greatly with the sustenance and the way of life of the beasts. So again, he's saying we're distinguished from animals in the degree of, the level of the cooperation uh, we, we uh, enter into in building the common good. He says, further, if men had not congregated, cities would not have been built and populated. It was in consequence of this that laws and traditions were established, and these were followed by fair apportionment of justice and a fixed and ordered mode of living. As a result of these, men developed a peaceable outlook and a sense of restraint. Human life thus became more secure, and by giving and receiving, by interchange and application of talents, we came to want for nothing. 
So I've, he says, I've labored this point more than is necessary, for is there anyone to whom Panateus's verbose observations are not obvious, namely that no war leader or civil magistrate could have performed such great and saving exploits without the enthusiastic cooperation of his fellow men. Right, so his point is, again, that human beings thrive in cooperation, that we build cities in cooperation, we build traditions in cooperation. Uh, and when that breaks down, uh, then we have civil collapse. Uh, and he, he talks about this on the next uh, page, no doubt, with Caesar uh, and Mark Antony and the civil wars in mind. He says on page 60, um, Having assembled the other causes, floods, epidemics, ravages of nature, sudden invasion by hordes of wild beasts, the onset of which he demonstrates, he's talking about Pantheus' book on duty on which this is based, he, uh, on which he demonstrates has caused the expiration of certain races. He then shows how many more men, by contrast, have been wiped out by attacks made by other men in wars or civil commotions than by all other disasters. So cooperation, when one civilization or, or, or state makes war on another, but also the failure of cooperation, the collapse of, of uh, the state is very much on Cicero's mind. And we can see this because he very quickly turns in book two to the subject of, of the fate of tyrants, uh, clearly thinking of the recent assassination of Caesar. Uh, he says at the top of page 62, the death of this tyrant of ours, whom our state when crushed by armed force endured, and whom it obeys more especially now that he is dead, is not unique in testifying to the power of men's hatred to sow destruction. Other tyrants too have met similar ends and scarcely one of them has avoided a fate like his. Fear is a poor guarantor of a long life, whereas goodwill is a faithful one and indeed endures forever. So he's saying essentially tyrants can't rule simply by fear. They have to have cooperation, that a stable state is made, is created and is maintained through the cooperation of human beings, of he would say of men, not through... Um, the domination of one over another. Uh, this leads him into a discussion of how leading by fear does not work, uh, which includes some discussion of the conflicts uh, between Marius and Sulla, uh, the, the often seen as the beginning of the fall of the Republic. Um, from there then, he talks about how to virtuously build cooperation among men in the state. And one of his key points is that there can be no shortcut for glory. And I think he's thinking here of the populares like Caesar. Uh, he's thinking also probably of men like Marius and Sulla who sought to sort of rapidly rise to dominance. Um, he says you can't essentially fake virtue in order to, to rule, you come to be a statesman by exhibiting virtue. Um, page 68, he says, just as there is a systematic way, not only of making money, but also of investing, uh, investing it to meet our continuing expenses, both for necessities and for generous giving, so glory must be systematically both acquired and invested. It is true, however, that Socrates nobly declared that the nearest path to glory was by taking the shortcut, so to say, of behaving in such a way as to be the kind of person you would like to be thought to be, right? That's, that's a clever kind of joke. He's saying the, the only shortcut to glory is to take no shortcuts, right? But to actually be what you want to be thought to be. If people imagine that they can obtain enduring glory by deceit and empty exhibitionism and hypocrisy in word and look, they are wildly off the mark. True glory drops roots and also spreads its branches wide, whereas all the false claims swiftly wither like frail blossoms for no pretense can be long-lasting. 
So this is an important point because he's going to talk in book two about the virtues that are useful uh, to to in in statecraft uh, and in in becoming prominent within the state. But he wants to make it clear that he's not talking about which virtues to fake. He's talking about which virtues to actually have, that there's no shortcut to these virtues. Um, they have to be genuine. Um, and so what are the virtues, right? Well, let's look at a, a few of the, the virtues of a leader that Cicero looks at. Maybe this will be useful for us in the, the modern age in which we're obsessed with leadership and what makes a leader. Uh, Cicero might have some good suggestions for us. Uh, let's start on page 70, the bottom of the, of the page. He says, there are several types of theme which call for eloquence. And in our state, many young men have won praise by speaking before juries and in the presence of the people and in the Senate. So um, one of the virtues he sees as useful is eloquence and an and, and oratory, public speaking, such a fundamentally important part of ancient Rome as it was of uh, ancient Greece before. Uh, public debate decided most uh, actions of the state. Uh, trial. Um, was often purely a matter, uh, both criminal and civil trial, purely a matter of who stated their case best. Uh, and so oratory, which was the focus of most of uh, a Roman youth's education, uh, was also really the focus of public life. And so the first virtue that must be mastered Cicero says, as a good Roman, is speaking well, being well spoken. Um, he, he emphasizes this several times. It comes back to the point on page 77. He writes, closely related to this legal expertise is skill in public speaking, which carries greater weight, is more favorably received, and is more decorative. For what accomplishment can excel eloquence in winning the admiration of an audience, in raising the hopes of the needy, or in gaining the gratitude of clients defended in court? This was why our ancestors made eloquence the most honored of civil, civil accomplishments. So if a man is articulate and takes readily to hard work and undertakes the defense of many clients without reluctance and without payment, as was the practice amongst our forebearers, the opportunities for bestowing kindness and offering advocacy are legion. So the, the vital importance of oratory uh, in, in pursuing the common good, uh, we see that in Cicero. Um, along with that, there is an emphasis on generosity. Generosity was, of course, one of the honorable virtues or one of the pillars of honor that Cicero discussed in book one. He comes back to generosity in book two to discuss the ways that it is useful uh, to be generous. He writes on page 73, in general, people who dispense money fall into two groups, the extravagant and the generous. The extravagant squander their money on civic feasts, distributions of meat, gladiatorial shows, promotion of public games, and wild beast chases, all outliers for which they will be remembered only briefly or not at all. Generous folk, on the other hand, apply their resources to redeeming captives from pirates, relieving friends from the burden of debt, or helping them to provide dowries for their daughters, or aiding them in the acquisition or extension of property. So he says generosity shouldn't just be extravagance. It should be um, given really for the good, for something valuable and meaningful um, rather than, than mere extravagance. He emphasizes the um, utility of generosity in business, right? where he says, um, fitting, this is on page 76, fitting behavior will include both generosity and given and forbearance in exacting dues and in the transaction of all business. 
buying and selling, hiring and letting, disputes with neighbors and boundary demarcations, being fair and affable, conceding to many people much that is rightfully yours, refraining from going to law in so far as the situation allows, and perhaps holding back a little more than that. For on occasion it is not only generous to forfeit a modicum of one's rights, but there are times when it is even profitable. So he says it might benefit you in business dealings, in property transactions, in, in legal transactions, to actually give more than you're obligated to, to be generous, um, will uh, come back to benefit you in the end, he says. Um, he also emphasizes being generous in, in public life, not to pursue your own good as a statesman. On page 81, Remember that he's writing, of course, to his son, and so perhaps thinking about uh, some someday uh, his son may be taking up his own uh, life, way of life as a, a statesman, as a politician. He says on 81, Therefore, to revert to the point from which my discussion digressed, there is no vice more squalid than greed, especially when invented by leaders and rulers of the state. For to exploit the state for gain is not merely base, but also criminal and wicked. So the oracular utterance of Pythian Apollo that Sparta was doomed to die through greed and nothing else seems to have been prophetic not only for the Spartans, but also for all wealthy nations. There is no easier way for men who administer the state to gain the goodwill of the common folk than by incorruptibility and restraint. So give yourself generously, we might say, to, to the state, not seeking your own uh, financial reward from service. And, and offices in the Roman state were not, were not paid. Um, you served really at your own expense. Um, he says th you know, this is a kind of generosity as well that is a, um, a useful virtue. Closely related to that is the um, virtue of hospitality, which he also emphasizes. Be willing to, to entertain um, in, in your own home. Uh, th then there is a, a fairly um, long discussion of justice as an element of statecraft. Uh, look at page 84, where he says, our conclusion is that those charged with the defense of the state will disassociate themselves from the kind of lavish distribution which robs Peter to pay Paul. Right? Don't take money from here and, and put it over there, right? but give everyone their due. Their primary concern will be to ensure that the individual keeps his possessions through the just process of law and the courts. Remember that in book one, Cicero defined justice as uh, giving each person that which is due to that person. That those in greater need are not victimized because of their lowly status and that the wealthy do not incur envy in retaining or recovering their property. It's interesting how actually similar Cicero's advice here is to much of the advice we see in um, the book of Proverbs. Um, Moreover, they themselves are to employ all possible means, both in war and at home, to enhance the power, territories, and revenues of the state. Right? In other words, don't be in it for yourself, be in it for the state. These are tasks for great men. These were regularly achieved in the days of our forebears. Right? So there's Cicero's sense of, sort of the, the decline and the collapse of the Republic, and the, maybe the loss of the most mayorum. Obligations like these will obtain great favor and glory for those who carry them through and will be of the utmost advantage to the state. Um, and so Cicero says, uh, you will prosper by pursuing the common good. Um, it is useful to you to pursue the common good, uh, the good of the state. Um, the good of people around you. And this is rooted in his sense of the communal nature of humanity.